Loved ones, Management 3234. This is session 19, if we were together, and Lord knows I wish we were. This would be 16 July, 2020. Um, our next class is the second midterm, three chapters, 6, 12, and 13. Today, we're gonna to focus on chapter 13, a very, very powerful chapter on, on uh, financing new ventures. Um, this won't surprise you. Um, new venture finance is radically different than corporate finance, so much so that we now have in our program, in our curriculum, uh, in the entrepreneurship and innovation emphasis, we have a course in new venture finance because new ventures can't go to the bank, they can't uh, issue stock, they, they are sort of barred from all traditional sources of capital. So it is well that you know what, what capital sources exist for early stage ventures. So before we start chapter 13 or whatever the chapter was, and it's really rich in content, I need to tell you a story, the AV story, attendance verification story, pretty clever, right? I grew up on my grandfather's dairy farm. Uh, wasn't that big, but uh, we had maybe 40 milkers and another 20, 25 cattle. But uh, that was the livelihood for, for uh, my grandfather and, and uh, the families of his two daughters for a while. My dad became an engineer and, and we, after a while we did not live on the farm. And, and uh, I, my grandfather sold it, I guess. He actually, he died when I was 11 or 12. I don't remember the specific year. And then my uncle Herb sold the farm when I was 16. So I haven't done any active farming since then. Um, I've helped friends in, in a lot of different contexts, but uh, grew up on my grandfather's dairy farm. The farm was named Echo Hill Farm. And uh, my mother, many years ago, 50 years ago, I guess, uh, found a photograph of the, of the farmhouse that she really loved. It showed the farmhouse, the barn, and the carriage house. And uh, she loved the photograph and she commissioned an artist to make a large oil painting of it. And that oil painting hangs now in my guest bedroom. Pretty neat. So the farm, as I mentioned just a moment ago, there were three buildings and only three. A lot of farms have lots and lots of outbuildings, but ours was not big in terms of the footprint. Um, so we had three, three buildings. We had the farmhouse, which was pretty darn large. And, and we had a barn, a dairy barn, uh, cattle all stayed there and we had a carriage house and a carriage house um, it's uh, I guess it's sort of an old concept but in any carriage house vehicles are staged or stored on the ground floor whether they are horse-drawn carriages or, or, or trucks or whatever the case may be but in a carriage house vehicles are stored or staged on the ground floor and the second story the upper level has living quarters so there were three buildings, a big farmhouse, a dairy barn, and a carriage house. And they, 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 the farmhouse and the barn touched, there was a connector, but the carriage house was freestanding, but not, not very far apart. Now, the farmhouse had a veranda, and I'm not an architect, but I'm pretty sure a veranda is a porch that, that has three sides. It, it, it spans the front of the house, and it goes down two sides. Uh, I've actually heard of porches go around all four sides, and I don't know what that would be called. But my grandfather's farmhouse had a veranda, a porch that spanned three sides of the house. And as a kid, I mean, I probably saw this when I was seven years old, and it, it fascinated me then, so much so that I remember it 65 years later, whatever the precise time is. My grandfather had a, a little hand-painted sign on the wall in the veranda, it, one, one part of it, and the sign had one of those life messages. It said, when it's hot, a man always wants it cool. When it's cool, a man always wants it hot. Always wanting what is not. And I just love that. It, it impacted me as a kid. So that's the story. Let's talk about chapter 13, Financing Startups. I'm on page 329 right now. And um, th this is not debt, this is equity financing, although we will talk about convertible debentures because that's pretty important. Equity financing says that you exchange control or ownership for cash.
That's what equity financing is. You, the owner of an organization, give up equity in exchange for cash. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all are Atlantans. Um, gosh, what was his name? Nally, Jim Nally. I did my dissertation studying every franchise automobile dealership in the state of South Carolina. There might be maybe 325 of them. But before I could develop a questionnaire, I had to know what I was talking about. So I went to the Nally Auto Group because his CFO was, was a former infantry officer. We knew each other. And I said, you know, can I, can I take you all to lunch and tell you what I'd like to do? And he said, sure. So we went to some fancy uptown club and they paid for it. But I essentially led on a pilot study. I said, I would like to study your, they, they were, at the time, the Nally Group had 10 stores. There were 10 dealerships. One of them was in Brunswick. The other nine were all in Metro Atlanta. And they spanned most of the marks. He had several Japanese franchises, as I recall, uh, Honda, Acura. Uh, he had at least one General Motors franchise. He had several Chevy stores. I mean, like only Chevrolet. Uh, but he had 10 stores, nine in Metro Atlanta, one in Brunswick. And uh, I essentially said to them, what I want to do is simply study your stores so that I have a, a sense for how dealerships operate in every dimension, every department. And then I'm gonna go do a study, I'll gather data from other dealerships. And when I finish, when I have results, I'll get scores on your 10 stores and I'll make a presentation to you in the hopes that uh, your management team can benefit from that. And that's precisely what we did. Uh, it was a good experience on every dimension. But Jim Nally, while I was doing this pilot study, it spanned about four months and, and God love them, they gave me complete access to all of their stores. They, they, they contacted every manager and said, Norton is on our side, he's a friendly, he's not consulting, he's not gonna suggest changes, he's simply trying to learn. So give him anything he asks for that's legitimate. So, um, so Jim exchanged a 90% ownership in the Nally Auto Group, these 10 stores, for a very big pile of cash. And he took the cash and did other stuff. Now what he did is he surrendered ownership and operational control to a venture capital firm. He sold a 90% interest and now the venture capitalists get 90% of the profits and, and all that other stuff. So equity financing is the exchange of ownership. You give up some kind of ownership in a business for cash. That's what equity financing is. And there are lots of forms. So on 331, there's a fun presentation, and I think they call it Shares of the Pie. And somewhere in there, they say that the, the three folks who founded Google uh, only owned 16% of it. But at the time the book was written, I think it might be 2018 copyright. At the time the book was written, Google was worth 85 billion. Okay, 16% of 85 billion is a big bucket of money. So I have a parallel story to share with you that is probably much closer to our lives than, than a tech giant like a Google or a Facebook or somebody like that. Lived in the Louisville area for 10 years, was uh, plugged into that community. I had a good friend named Kent Euler. Kent was a serial entrepreneur. Gosh, when I knew him, when I met him 20 years ago, I think he'd been involved in 13 or 14 different new ventures. Some of them were quite successful, some of them uh, sort of flickered out like a flame that was extinguished. So Kent and two other men started a business called High Speed Access. I'll just use the, uh, the acronym, HSA, High Speed Access. High Speed Access went from inception, the founding of the firm, to an IPO in two and a half or three years. Stunning, it really was. But this was, uh, I'm trying to think of the year that it launched, High Speed Access literally provided the last mile of connectivity for internet access. Uh, companies would, uh, uh, would build an apartment complex or an office tower or something like that, and they'd have ethernet cable run into it, but this was well before there were Wi-Fi networks. You had to literally plug into an ethernet connection in the wall. That's what High Speed Access did. It took these buildings with multiple occupants, whether they were commercial tenants or or apartment dwellers or whatever, and they would build in this last mile of connectivity. They would literally build in the ethernet connections. So that was pretty big stuff 25 years ago or so. And uh, so Kent's company went from inception to a public offering in, in two and a half or three years. 
Uh, I, I was pretty close to them at the time, and I remember that there were four, four rounds of venture capital funding. I don't remember the, the first three. The fourth round was about 95 or 100 million, and, and as I say, they went public uh, within two and a half or three years of inception, which was pretty remarkable. But they happened to be at a, in a space, in a market space that was really valued, and that's why the company grew so quickly. So here's what I want to show you about this uh, share of the pie thing that that the textbook talks about. So at the start of this process, I'm putting the word inception on the board. There were three founders and they owned 100% of the stock. So that's the whole pie, agreed? So now, over the course of two and a half or three years, the company has three rounds, four, forgive me, four rounds of venture capital funding, all in the tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. So a great deal of capital is invested in the company so that it can scale up and roll up, have a big footprint. And, uh, and obviously, those were four runs of venture capital funding, and every single time a venture capitalist said, here's 100 million bucks or whatever the sum was, they would give up equity for cash. They would relinquish ownership. So their ownership was diluted each and every round of funding. And then, of course, when the company goes public, oh my goodness. So here's the reality. At the IPO, these same three men owned 7% of the stock. They had surrendered 93% of the stock between the four rounds of venture capital funding and the initial public offering when the company was public. And I guess it was listed on NASDAQ. I think that was the exchange. Now, you may know this because you're pretty bright people. The Securities and Exchange Commission <clears throat> has regulatory oversight over all companies whose stock is traded on any exchange. And, and it, it's an organization that is rules-based. Uh, there, there's a heavy burden of compliance. So one of the things that the SEC requires, not our SEC, not the football conference, but the Securities and Exchange Commission, one of the things that the SEC requires is if you own stock, if you're part of the founding group and you own stock at an initial public offering, there's a lock-in. You are not permitted to sell that stock for six months. Uh, I think that probably goes back to the 1930s or something like that. But uh, my understanding is the genesis of that lock-in rule was that decades ago, 50, 60, 70 years ago, it didn't exist and, and companies would go public, sell the stock, get a couple hundred million dollars, and then the, the venture team would just say, we're rich, let's leave. And the company would collapse. So the Securities and Exchange Commission requires this six month lock-in. So, when the lock-in expired, six months later, six months after the IPO, this 7% was worth, this, this is the 7%, not the whole company, the 7% of high-speed access was worth $115 million. Now that's not nearly as much as the fact that we make every year because we are so wealthy. But would you, would you rather have 100% of nothing or 7% of a company, and your tiny, tiny fractional ownership is worth 150 million bucks. Nice place to be. And, and I get it that Google is a, is a visible story, but Google's also a tech giant. These are three standard ordinary people who had an idea, had a concept that the market valued, had great success in terms of launching the company, taking it public, and, and you can see the results. So this thing about, you give up, you surrender equity in exchange for cash, but what is your share of the pie worth? The three Google founders, it's worth uh, apparently 16 billion as of 2018, and my three friends at Louisville um, did a pretty good job in my view. So, I wanna talk now about stage financing because that's a very big deal. What stage financing says is you give up equity, ownership or control of your company in stages. There is no one out there, I don't think, I mean, I don't care if it's an Arab sheik, a crazy drug dealer, there's nobody that's gonna say, what, you want 30, 40 million? Here it is, all of it right now. Absolutely everybody that has any private equity investment in an early stage venture does something that unsurprisingly, called milestones. Together, you, the venture team, and the equity financier decide on what your capital needs are and what must be accomplished. They may say, okay, the moment that you have 
patent approval for whatever it is that you're doing. We know that, I'm making this up, we know that you need 30 million for the next stage to be able to get the product manufactured and distributed to some early users. So let, let's assume that that is, that is your stage two. So you get the patent approval, they give you $30 million, and of course they take stock ownership in exchange for that, so now they own a fractional interest in the company. And you, over the course of the next 10 or 12 or months or whatever the case may be, you ramp up manufacturing and get this stuff through your distribution channels out to end users. And, and they may say, okay, that's good. Now stage three is, so my point is, everybody that invests, invests in stages, and they do it based on milestones. The new venture and the equity financier agree on what must be accomplished. And when you, the new venture team, accomplishes that goal, that releases the next round of funding. And the next round of funding will have its own criteria. Uh, you have to accomplish something else that you're eligible for another round. Uh, and and uh, typically, the stage financing model, I've seen so much complexity built into this, I think it's fair to say that stage financing really has three stages. The seed state of financing is just proof of concept. Oftentimes, the seed stage financing comes from the founding team. It's quite rare for anybody to say, yeah, here's a lot of money, go see if the concept and, and the amount of money needed for seed financing is usually only a few thousand bucks. Uh, you build a prototype, you, uh, you come up with a, a few examples, you take them to beta sites, you uh, build a few of whatever it is that you're manufacturing, and you put them out in a pilot market, and then you get feedback from people. But my point is, seed stage financing typically is only a few thousand dollars because all you're doing is proving the concept. I wouldn't launch a business unless I had evidence that the concept would be valued in the market. I think that we are crazy in the head if we don't prove a concept before we start seeking financing and, and making it bigger and faster and better and whatever else. So proof of concept is critical. It is the first stage, it's called the seed stage, and typically the money for the seed stage comes from the founding team. Now, the next stage is classically called the startup stage. So let's assume that you and some co-venturers throw in a few thousand bucks and you prove the concept and now you've got something to sell to me if I'm the equity financier. I'm, a, I'm an investor who invests in early stage businesses and you've got something to bring to me now. So you bring this to me and say okay we've proved the concept, we've got patent protection, whatever the case may be, whatever important milestone you need to accomplish and we'd like to approach you for money for a startup phase. We want to launch the business and that may mean that we need to lease manufacturing space, we need to hire staff, we need to buy raw materials to convert that into inventory, we need to have a sales team to develop a strategy and get stuff out there in the market. So whatever the launch phase is the launch phase. You've proven the concept, and now you're actively seeking equity financing so that you'll have the cash to build out the business and launch, start selling stuff. So you have, you have a seed phase that typically comes from the founders, the launch phase, the startup phase, if you will, comes from equity financiers. And then after that, you'll often, often have other stages of financing if you're growing or building the business. What if I lease some manufacturing space and I buy some equipment and I hire some production staff and some engineers, but I'm only capable of manufacturing and distributing 40,000 units a year because I have these physical constraints. That may be enough to launch the business, to get me out there, to get buzz, to get acceptance in the market, but I'm capped at 40,000 units. What if I think the market space might permit me to sell 2 million or 16 million or whatever the case may be? I need money to grow and build a business. So that may mean that, may mean that I want to, instead of leasing a small space, I may want to build a facility which, which takes me up there. Now, I, I, because I'm a relatively cautious man, I would build the facility and then just grow the, the production capacity, not exponentially, but maybe by a factor of three or four or five. 
Because now instead of making 40,000 units a year, I might be making 2 million units a year. Is the market still absorbing those 2 million units? Well, if they built a big enough building, I could add more equipment, more staff, yes? So all I'm saying to you is, seed is the first stage. That's when we prove the concept. It usually comes from the founding team. The uh, startup phase is when we get money from equity financiers and we launch the business. We are manufacturing, we're selling product or services, whatever it is that we're doing. And then the other phases, and, and I can't know how many there would be, HSA had a total of four rounds of equity financing before they went public. And of course, clearly the first one was a, was a, was a launch round. Then they had three stages where they grew and built the business, yes? Wouldn't they want to be in other markets like, I know they started in Louisville. Uh, if I were doing that, I would have a presence starting in Louisville in the Midwest. Then I'd grab some major city in the Southeast like a Charlotte or an Atlanta. Then I'd grab something in the Mid-Atlantic states. Uh, I don't know what that might be. Maybe Arlington, Virginia wouldn't be in Maryland because that's a crazy place. Uh, I might grab one in New England, maybe in Boston. Then I would grab one on the left coast. Uh, when I say the left coast, I would, I would count the Rockies. I, I might consider a footprint in Denver. I might consider, consider a footprint in San Diego. But you see my point? I would expand to five or six markets very discreetly. But I would do the stages, wouldn't I? So stage financing is seed, startup, and then these growth and build out stages. That's sort of the model for stage financing in, uh, in equity. Now, I'm on 333, big discussion of valuation. And y'all, that is a hot mess. I actually was well paid on many instances to help privately held companies develop valuation, either for a target company, one that they were interested in buying, or a company that wished to be acquired by someone else. So I have some meaningful experience with that. And that doesn't mean anything except to say that I have some meaningful experience and valuation is a hot mess. There are probably five or six different techniques that are used, but the truth is, the only one that seems to be significant for early stage businesses is something called the discounted cash flow model. What that says, and, and let me just sort of develop a, a quick prototypical example, you are the new venture team, and you want to, uh, you want to get money in from equity financiers, but you have to be able to say, here's what the company is worth, and here's your share give us X millions of dollars. So what you would do in this process of a discounted cash flow is you would, you would authentically forecast your cash flows for the next five years. And the truth is you can do it quite well for one, and after that it's just an arithmetic extension. We're gonna grow by X, our costs will increase by Y, our, our revenues are gonna be Z, and when we discount that to cash, we get double A. But my point is you forecast cash flows the, the, the inflows and outflows of cash in your business for the next five years. What that means is when you have the total inflows minus the total outflows, you have some residual. And you have that, you have that sum of money for each of the five years in this period. So you take that total sum of money and you discount it. You discount one of them for four years, one of them for three, one of them for two, one of them for one. At, at some internal rate of return, let's say it's 35%. What that does is it gives you a net present value. You discount the cash flows because money has a time value, and then you sum those discounted cash flows, and I'm gonna make up something that is stupid easy. Let's say that in this forecasting model that you've developed, your disc the, the valuation of your company using discounted cash flows says that today, today, you're worth two million bucks because the only thing you have to give anybody is cash. Another owner, it's the only thing you have to give another owner is cash. So that means that if you say, okay, equity financier, we believe we need, if you say you need a million six to do something, what does that mean? A million six over two million means that you're asking them to give you 80% of the valuation of the company today. And that's legitimate. So they give you a million six, you give them 80% of the stock, you only have 20. But with a million six, you do something important. Now, here's what could happen. You grow the business and you do another valuation. And, 
and that may mean that you value the new company at 16 million or 20 million or whatever, not the new company, the same company, but farther in its life trajectory. It has more sales, more profitability, more cash. Well, clearly its valuation would have gone up. So you can go back to the same investor group or a new investor group, uh, because now you're worth more, yes? Even though you gave up 80% of the stock, that was at a moment in time, early in the company's history. And if you're worth considerably more, that means you have more equity to sell. So there are, there are a lot of different techniques, but the discounted cash flow uh, valuation is the only one that I've ever seen, ever seen used in private equity. I'm not talking what, what people do who, who, are, who are CFOs for Delta Airlines or Caterpillar or anybody who's a corporate or Fortune 50 company. But in new equity financing, I have only ever seen this kind of cash flow to use, uh, and it's messy. Now, I'm on 385, and there's a conversation about uh, convertible debt, really significant. I want you to know that. Um, it is commonly, commonly, not occasionally, commonly used by venture capitalists. And my view is that if you seek equity capital, and the venture capitalists give you the money, but they take back convertible debt, everybody wins. And the reason I say everybody wins is the financiers have a collateral position in your firm, so they have priority if something ugly happens. Uh, they get a return if you're successful, and you get the cash to do what you need to do. So using convertible debenture is a big deal. A convertible debenture is probably what you think it is intuitively. Let's assume that I'm a principal in a venture capital firm and we agreed to give your firm 10 million bucks. That is our, our investment at this stage of your company's life. So instead of taking X shares of stock, we don't want common stock because that means we come in last if there's a liquidation. We say, we're gonna give you 10 million. The instrument that you'll give us back is a convertible debenture. What that means is it's a debt instrument and you, the company, owe us 10 million bucks. And you have to pay us interest every week, month or whatever the, whatever the frequency is. So the venture capitalists in my example have a collateral interest, they're protected if there's a liquidation and they have a modest income. Now, when this arrangement comes to fruition, when you get the cash and you give the instrument, you will, you will decide to negotiate at that moment in time what the conversion feature is. And here's, here's what, what you may say, let's, I'm just gonna make this up. Let's say that, that uh, that uh, we negotiate, I'm the financier, you're the, you're the venturer. We negotiate that this instrument can be converted into equity for uh, 20,000 shares of common stock. So I'm the VC, I'm the venture capitalist, I give you 10 million, I get a convertible to venture. For three or four years, you pay me interest, everybody's happy. You have the money to do cool stuff, I'm protected and I have a modest income stream, basically an interest stream. But I'm well pleased, I'm very happy with the way you've managed the business and grown it, and, and I think that, that, that I'm in money right now. So I say to you, all right, I'm gonna convert my debenture into common stock. When I simply announce that, the debt is canceled and you issue, well, whatever I said a moment ago, 20,000 shares of common stock to me. So now I'm a common stockholder. That means I've seen a positive trajectory. I've seen growth and good promise. Now. What if, what if you swung and missed? You took the money, did good things, but the market said, not interested, and your sales fall down to critically low levels, there's no potential for you to grow. Whether you liquidate or not, I'm the financier and I'm at least protected because since I have a debt instrument, I will be paid first out of any, any proceeds, out of any kind of a liquidation. And I still get the 8% interest or 6% or whatever we agree. So a convertible debenture is commonly used by venture capitalists, and it is my view, and you can challenge that, it is my view that everybody wins, everybody benefits. If I'm the, if I'm the financier and things are going well, I'm gonna convert it into, into equity. I want stock, I don't want debt. I don't want you to pay me off if I can own this company and, and have the value of it appreciate over time. So convertible debentures are, are really, really good. Now, um, there's a discussion that starts on page 336 about angels. I will make a simple observation to you, and that is that I don't care how they're presented, how they're gift wrapped, angels are informal investors. In 
most cases, angels have been successful in some other business. They are serial entrepreneurs. Um, they um, built a company, sold it, and a lot of money left over. I, I know a couple of dozen people who meet that criterion. Um, some, I know some people have just been very, very successful in business. I want to tell you a story about Texas Roadhouse because I know Kent Taylor pretty well. Kent was an entrepreneur in residence when I was at Indiana University, go Hosers. We were Hoosiers, I know. But I uh, got to know the man well, and uh, Texas Roadhouse is based in Louisville, and it, it is a, a magnificent success story. Uh, the company is now in about 35 states, their revenues in the billions, uh, really, really hitting all the marks. So I, I know enough about Texas Roadhouse to hold them in high regard. So, Kent himself, the founder of Texas Roadhouse, once worked for Applebee's, and he was with them for 15, 16 years, and he simply did not see a way forward. He did not see a meaningful path for growth and development. So he left Applebee's. He opened a restaurant with a guy in, in Louisville, Kentucky, named John Y. Brown III. John Y. was once the governor of Kentucky, and he was married to Phyllis George, who was once Miss America. And John Y had bought Kentucky Fried Chicken from the Sanders family, Harlan Sanders family, and owned it for a few years and then sold it for stupid money to somebody else. So John was in a good place. He had a good political career. He was married to an extraordinary mate. He, uh, he was unbelievably successful, but he didn't want to work hard. By that I mean he was just kind of, he was chill, yes. That's the 2020 variation. Um, but Ken still had a, a fire in his belly. And John Y. and Ken owned a really nice restaurant right on the Ohio River in Louisville called Buckhead's. And it's a great place. I used to love to go there for lunch and occasionally dinner. So Ken was a co-owner. And, and Ken's the guy that was the active manager. John Y. wasn't there actively managing. Ken was making hiring decisions and all the other things that you would do managing a, sort of a high-end steakhouse. But Kent wanted to grow and John White didn't. So Kent had three customers who would come up regularly, two or three times a month. They were all physicians who lived and practiced in Elizabethtown. E-Town is maybe 60, 70 miles away from Louisville on, on Interstate 65. So these folks would come up to the big city and have an evening out and shop or go to the theater or whatever they would do. Um, so Kent, over, over several years, built a relationship with these three physicians and he pitched an idea to them. He said, I want to start a steakhouse chain. I cannot do it without some kind of, of startup capital. I wonder if you'd be willing to provide it. Well, they knew Kent well. They knew his experience at Applebee's. They knew his success running the steakhouse on the river. And that's what he was proposing, was a chain of steakhouses. So three physicians, six, these are angel investors. They're not formal investors. This is not their day job. Their day job is practicing medicine but they'd all been successful and they were still active practitioners, they weren't retired. So these three docs, over the course of a few months or a year maybe, gave Kent a total, a grand total of a million bucks. And that was sufficient for Kent to start this business, this publicly held company that you and I know as Texas Roadhouse. And it took a while, it took from like maybe, I don't know, I'm thinking 1992 to maybe 2007 or eight, before the company went public. Um, I would never start a business in, in that space. Uh, there are so many people in the steakhouse business. You put a piece of dead cow on a plate and you serve a drink and a salad. Uh, that, that's a hyper competitive environment and there's no way to differentiate yourself, blooming onions notwithstanding. So all I'm saying is I think it's a hyper competitive environment but, but Kent had the domain knowledge to make it work and he proved that. So these three docs invested a million bucks in the early stage of the business. And it was every bit of 15 or 16 years later before the company went public. But when the lockout expired, the three physicians owned 11% of the company. Are you kidding me? It took 15 years. But those three angel investors, their million dollars became 11% of a very successful growing publicly held company. So that's what angel investors are. They are informal investors and they tend to just be people who are successful uh, in, in some other business endeavor.
I want to give you two examples that I'm aware of. Uh, we are based here in Statesboro. There's an angel investor club in Louisville. Forgive me, I said Louisville. I meant to say Savannah. There's a group of angel investors in Savannah called Aerial Angels. They spell it just like the Disney princess. A-I, forgive me, A-R-I-E-L. Aerial Angels. It's a group of investors. They have a luncheon meeting once a month. If you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you get to go through a vetting process. You submit a one or two page document and they say, okay, we like what you've got. We'd like to schedule you to present on July 27th. So you show up on the 27th and they give you seven or eight or 10 minutes and then you get to have a little trade area display and people will come up and interact if they were engaged by your pitch. And they'll have between three and five presentations every month. These are just informal investors who gather for lunch once a month and, and uh, aspiring entrepreneurs make presentations and I promise you there's a whole lot of linking up. There was another angel investor firm in Louisville called Iceberg Investors, and I loved it. The guy that started Iceberg Investors, he is now the mayor of Louisville. He's now the mayor. And uh, he and his family sold a business for maybe 75 million bucks, and, and his dad retired. His brother did exactly what I would have done. He took his share and he moved to the Rockies and he spends his time elk hunting and skiing. Who wouldn't do that? But Greg, my friend who's now the mayor of Louisville, Greg wasn't ready for that. So he continued on with other things and he started this angel investment firm. And the max they will invest is a quarter million bucks in any business. They also have to be the very first people who are investors. They're not willing to come in behind others. Max a quarter of a million, they have to be the first equity investors in a business. And if you think about the name, Iceberg Investors. I don't know if this is true, I'm not an oceanography guy, but for all of my life, I've heard that only 10% of an iceberg is visible above the surface of the water. The other 90% is beneath the surface. Iceberg Investors. It, it's a, a formal angel investment thing. And I know that that sounds like a, like a, a play on words because angel investors, it, arguably or informal, but Greg was successful in another business and he took some of the proceeds from the sale of that business and just created a little fund and he has very simple criteria. Uh, and so there are a lot of a lot of angel investors out there, probably in every community. Probably in every community. Venture capitalists, I'm on 341. The distinction between venture capitalists and angel investors are venture capitalists are formal investors. A VC firm, a venture capital firm, is structured just as if it were a mutual fund. There are principals, people who invest in it, people who make decisions. There are staff, they're usually financial analysts. The, the principals, the actual venture capitalists themselves, will literally approach affluent investors and they'll say something like this. They'll say to you, affluent investor, we are, uh, we're forming a venture capital fund. Where we'll reach 150 million, we're gonna start investing and our fund will only invest in, and then they'll tell you what they know a lot about. They may know a lot about biomed, they may know a lot about telecommunications, they may, they may work with defense contractors like DARPA people, I don't know. But they'll say, we're gonna invest in these industries because we know a great deal about them. Our targeted returns are, are uh, 15 to 25%. Um, every time we have a liquidity, and every time that we sell a, one of our portfolio companies or every time we have an IPO, distribute cash to you or you can reinvest and the units are 25,000 each, 100,000 each, whatever the case may be. So the principles of the venture capital firm literally go to investors and they pool very large sums of money and when they reach the target of their fund they then begin to invest and they have uh, all sorts of different criteria. Um, the, uh, these these uh, funds typically have a 10-year life. At that point, they sell the assets and distribute, and people can reinvest if they want. And, and again, they, uh, they're professionally managed and they have rigorous standards. And, and the last time I, uh, there's, a, there's a thing called Pratt's Guide, P-R-A-T-T-S, Pratt's Guide. It's a guide of active venture capital firms. I haven't had one of my hands for probably four years, maybe five. 
but the last time I read a Pratt Scott, I used to see them often. They're often in libraries, actually. You don't have to have a subscription. You can often find Pratt's Guide in libraries. But uh, the last time I looked at it, four or five years ago, there were probably 700 active venture capital firms in the United States. I just wanted to give you a sense, and, and uh, a lot of VC firms uh, swing and miss, and I mean big, big misses. Um, the people invested in Snapchat regret it because the stock is about 50% of its IPO price. Uber, Lyft, same kind of dynamic. Uh, WeWork, there's a, 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 I guess it's a Japanese venture capital fund, it's called SoftBank. I know it's Asian and I think it's based in Japan, but it is SoftBank, just as it sounds, SoftBank. And uh, they invested something like $100 million in uh, WeWork and uh, the company maybe is larger than that. Right now, the company is worth 8% of their investment. If they invested 100 million today, their share is worth 8 million. That's a lot of swinging and missing. And I don't think that's ever gonna grow back. I think WeWork was a, was a deeply flawed concept from the start. I can't imagine why anybody would have seen virtue in that subleasing office space. Um, so my point is there, there are a lot of very big, very visible mistakes because nobody in private equity wants to miss the next big thing. Uh, if you look at the valuations of Tesla right now, they are stupid beyond any rational thought or expectation. But the people in private equity say, okay, maybe electrification is where we're going. Maybe autonomous vehicles is where we're going. We can't miss the next big thing. So let's throw lots of money at Tesla. Uh, again, I, I think it's a terrible investment, but that's my view of the world. All I'm saying is, even though venture capital firms are formal, they have very rigorous standards, because of this bias, nobody wants to miss the next big thing. We can't know what the next big thing is, can we? But nobody wants to miss it. So companies that just seem to be ridiculous have stupefying values like WeWork and Tesla and places like that until reality hits. So, I um, want to talk to you about harvest strategies. I'm on 348 right now. Here's something that the text points out that I think is an incredibly useful perspective. And that is you, the aspiring entrepreneur, as a new venturer, you should develop a harvest strategy before you launch the business. Before you launch the business, you should say, what conditions will exist for me to exit this business? Now, exit might mean gracefully shutting it down. What if you cannot achieve uh, even remotely satisfying levels of sales? Would you continue to flog it, beat it to death? It might be well to simply sell the assets and take whatever residual and do something else. What if, what if you're at a stage in life, whether it's age, uh, family development, who knows what, where you think you'd like to throttle back and not work such hard, long hours, or you think you'd like to travel less, or you think you'd like to have fewer responsibilities? What if you say to yourself, when I think I can get 100x of my initial investment or 50x, I will literally find someone to acquire the business because uh, mergers and acquisitions are very, very common liquidity strategies. So all I'm saying is what I'm saying. I'm just reinforcing what the text says. And the, the text says you should develop a harvest strategy when you launch the business. Don't find yourself two and a half years down the road or 12 years down the road with no earthly idea about how you're going to get out. In some cases, businesses are intergenerational gifts to family members. That describes almost every car dealership in this nation. Um, what is currently J.C. Lewis here in Statesboro was a three-generation Ford dealership. Frank Rozier sold the dealership to the Lewis family. Frank inherited the dealership from his dad who inherited the dealership from Frank's grandfather. So Frank's grandfather started it. it, it Three generations of Rozier family members owned it for 59 years. Frank wanted to exit the business. He had two adult children. One was a practicing attorney in Atlanta. The other has a very successful ag business here in the county. Both of them said, Dad, no interest in running a car dealership. So Frank went to the Lewis family 
that Honest to Gosh has been selling Ford products since for 110 years. Mr. Lewis himself, J.C. Lewis, was a personal friend of Henry Ford. Uh, they owned island properties and homes in Richmond Hill and, and places like that. So that's how far back the Lewis family goes as Ford dealers. And now the Lewis family has four stores. They have the original J.C. Lewis Ford on Abercorn. They bought the uh, what was Roger Ford here in the borough. They, uh, I don't know if they built or acquired a dealership in Heinz Hill in close proximity to Fort Stewart. And they, in the last six months, the, uh, the Lewis family has bought what used to be Fairway Lincoln Mazda in Savannah. So my point is that I know Walter Lewis personally. He's a neat guy. I rode in his Cobra. We're, we've shot sporting plays together. Lewis himself, Walter Lewis, is one of, I think, four brothers and their third generation. Their, their adult children are now moving into leadership roles in the dealership. So the Lewis family has owned four dealerships for 110 years. The fourth generation is now active in the business. So lots of times this exit strategy is simply an intergenerational gift. But lots of times you'll think, okay, if things go sideways, when am I gonna exit if, if I have a very disappointing run? And similarly, at what point will I sell the business? Will I achieve a particular financial goal? Is it a quality of life goal? I want to travel less, I want more family time. But you need to develop a harvest strategy when you launch the business. Now, it would be fair to say that that strategy can evolve, can't it? It might shift, you might decide on, on different metrics, different decision rules, but you need to have an exit strategy and you should have one, an exit strategy, a harvest strategy, and you should have one when you start the business. So the only other thing I want to talk about is something that's discussed on 349. They call it the entrepreneur's dilemma. Um, what they're actually talking about here is, is what the literature, what the entrepreneurship literature calls the founder's trap. And they give an example in the text. Um, but uh, I, I want to talk to you more about the founder's trap because that is a stream of literature that is well developed in the entrepreneurship domain. Uh, everybody has dilemmas. A dilemma is a problem with no good solutions. So every, all of us have dilemmas, but the founder's trap is something that's, that's unique to people in entrepreneurial roles, and it, it happens to what you would say are the biggest or the brightest. So here's what the founder's trap looks like. Let's, let's pretend that I'm an entrepreneur and I launch a business, and goodness gracious, I'm very, very successful. So when I start this business, I have a clear sense that this business, and this will be your reality, that this business will reflect my values. Whatever my values are, whether it is to, to be active in a community, whether it is to, to uh, have, a, have an active physical role in what you would call sustainability on any form that may take, uh, whether it is to have excellence in product, the most extraordinary level of service, to, to all of us, every person in this organization is gonna behave ethically or she or he is gonna be gone. So my point is that any business that you start will reflect your values. Any business that I start will reflect mine. Now, so I start a business and in my silly example, it is wildly successful. All of a sudden I'm 18 months in and I'm busting through 10 million in revenue and I'm on my way to infinity. Didn't Buzz Lightyear say that? I should use that as a question, shouldn't I? To infinity and beyond. You know, most of the econ guys have Bud Light here dolls, those little toys and their wings poke out and stuff. They are, they are sad people. You have to love an economist because nobody else does. You have to love them, yeah. So, in my silly example, I start this business, I launch it, it is, it is beyond my wildest expectations in terms of success. So I'm growing stupid fast, I'm getting a huge footprint, I'm getting market acceptance everywhere. Every context, every region, all over the world, and I think, oh my gosh, I can't do all this stuff. I need bright people like you. I need people who are trained as, a, who are educated as accountants, as logisticians to manage supply chains. I need finance people. I need engineers. I need people in operations management. I need I people who do work production if I make something. I need marketing folks and legal teams and all of these, these competencies that I don't have. So somewhere in this remarkable growth trajectory, I have to populate my entire firm, every unit, 
with people whom I would call professional managers, people who are educated and equipped to carry out a discrete set of tasks much better than I can. Now, here's the dilemma in the founder's trap. Most people who find themselves in the founder's trap were the champions. They were the people who, who, who were the spark plugs. They had this idea, this concept, and they brought it to market and they wrapped a venture team around it. They got resources and they developed a strategy and all of a sudden they are winning in the market. They are prevailing in meaningful ways, but they don't have the competencies to do what you can do. They don't have degrees in logistics, accounting, finance. Nobody has all those skills. So you have to populate the firm with all these professional managers, but the founder's trap is the founder often, often, not occasionally, is reluctant to give up decision-making control. Are you kidding me? You don't have the competencies to make the accounting decisions, the marketing decisions, the logistics, production, design. You don't have the skills or competencies to do it, but you don't relinquish control. So you joined this firm thinking it was on a real uptick and very promising, and you're there for two and a half, three years, and you realize that the big boss is never gonna let go of his or her decision-making authority. You think, I'm done. There's no place for me to grow here. I've got this micromanager who knows less about this domain than I do, but he or she is telling me what to do. So what you do is you create a cadre of people who realize that they've hit this, this uh, ceiling and they, they punch out. So you start now having turnover, disruption, but you're, re you're reluctant to relinquish control. You may know this because you're pretty bright, bright people. Years ago, 20 years ago or so, Apple, fired Steve Jobs. He was the founder, he was the CEO, but he was doing things that were disruptive inside the organization. And the board director said, we know you founded this outfit, you get to keep the stock, but you no longer have a job here. Oh dear. They hired a guy named John Scully, who did a competent job, and then Scully left. And, and, and at the time, Jobs was at Pixar, he did some fun things over there, and, and Apple brought him back. But it's common for board of directors to fire the founder because the founder is unwilling to relinquish control. I birthed this child, I grew the child, and I'm gonna, you know, now that we're at maturity, I'm gonna keep making all these decisions. Not sitting on the board of directors, not saying to you, here's what the goal is, you decide best how to accomplish it, or let's have a group meeting or something like that. But the founder's trap says that the founder launch a successful business that grows beyond the founder's ability to manage all of its functions. So the founder populates this firm with bright, well-educated people just like you, and then does not give you decision-making authority. That is the founder's trap. And so many founders find themselves in that very position. They can't grow because they can't control this company without your help. And then everybody that they hire very quickly thinks, wait a minute, I'm not gonna stay here. This place is an extension of you. I don't get to make any decisions. I can't grow or develop. So I'm gone. I'll go somewhere that I can grow and develop. So that's a quick look at the founder's trap. Again, the, the textbook calls it the entrepreneur's dilemma, but that's not what the literature calls it. And, and they actually give a good example in the text. It's something about king and queen, about the founder's trap. So for today, we are done dogs. And uh, the attendance verification question is utterly straightforward. What was the name of my grandfather's dairy farm? That's it, love you, talk to you all soon.